I grew up in, in, in my walk with Jesus in, in the children's ministry. And, and that's where, where you, you learn fun. If you can't have fun with kids, then, then you're going to be boring and, and the kids are going to go down the street. They're not going to come back and, and want to hear more about Jesus. I, I got up this morning and I, was, I know it's uh, 4th of July, Independence Day weekend. And I, and I want to put a big shout out to all those who have served in the military. I'm not a military person, but uh, we salute you guys and ladies. We thank you for your service. We honor you. We respect what you, what you do when you put that uniform on for us. Um, like I said, I'm not a military person. My dad did serve in the Navy. My wife's father was in the Army. Uh, two of my boys were in the military. One was in the Air Force and one was in the Army. So I, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of respect, and, and we honor you and thank you for keeping us free. Amen? Um, but I got up this morning, and I said, I, I need to respect the, those that went before us and, and those that are serving. I, I needed to dress in red, white, and blue. And I'm, so I kind of feel like I look like a Baptist pastor this morning. I, I realized that as I was driving here, it was too late to turn around and go back and, and, and switch. And, and I couldn't find anything else that was red, white, and blue anyway. The only other tie, I, I had a, a tie that's red, white, and blue. I thought I could just wear that tie and, and a blue shirt and be fine in jeans, you know. And that's where I would probably uh, be more comfortable. But I, I looked at the tie and... and uh, um, it was SpongeBob and, and uh, Santa Claus. <laughs> Back to that time that I spent in, in children's ministry and, and, and having fun with kids and just having fun with Jesus. And, and that's what it's about. Um, I got to put my glasses on, though, because my eyes aren't as young as I am. We, we, uh, before we get started in, in, in what God has given me to talk about here this morning, uh, there's a couple things that I feel like I need to go over. Uh, some updates real quick. COVID, you know, we, we, we don't like this. I don't like the idea of putting a mask on. And if you're here and you feel you, you want to have a mask, we respect that. We honor that. We don't have a problem with that. And if you don't, we don't have a problem with that either. Um, but I do think that, you know, we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we don't cross over a line and go, and go the wrong way and get this thing shut down again, folks. Um, and, and I'm probably just as guilty as the next person because I love folks. I, I love to hang out with people and give hugs and, and shake hands and, and everything, you know. But it, this, this thing is, is you know, there's, there's, there's some news that's not right and there's some misinformation going around, I think, on a lot of different fronts. But we still need to use common sense and be careful, okay? Just that simple, you know. I, I don't, I'm not saying closed churches down, but I got to tell you, I had a call this last Monday, I think it was, from a good friend of mine, a pastor down in a little town of Eastman, Georgia, and that little town has been devastated in the last couple of weeks by COVID. The, uh, uh, half the fire department is, is in, in, has been tested positive. Uh, two different churches had a large portion of their congregations test positive. Uh, the bank, the, uh, one of the leaders of the bank is, is tested positive, is in the hospital. Our friend shut his church down. He said he's going to take a couple weeks off to, to give everybody the opportunity to, to, to isolate and, and make sure that everybody stays safe. And, and I, I'm, I love gathering together. I love being with you people. My wife and I um, have been really blessed, and, and we've got this really cool lodge that God blessed us with across the mountain. And, and we have people in and out all the time, and, and we get with folks, and, and we have fellowship. I, I don't know there was a day this past two weeks that we haven't had fellowship, but we just need to wash our hands, do the little things, folks, okay? Uh, I'm not trying to scare anybody or be a Debbie Downer because that's the opposite of what I want to do here this morning, but we, we need to, to just be respectful of each other and, and be careful out there, okay? Especially when you're going into places where, where you don't know what folks, the folks that are there and what's going on with them. Doesn't mean we can't love on them, but we just need to, you know, be aware of what's, what's around us. We don't need to walk in fear. We also, uh, uh, one other good thing that I want to mention, uh, for those of you that were here last week, you know there was something said about a, a coin shortage and, and there was no, and, and even to, leaning to the point where maybe there wasn't any cash. I just want you all to know that Nancy and I were at the bank getting a thing done this week. We ran into Ray and he took back the coins. There's coins for change now. 
He brought plenty back. He told us, I believe him. So you don't have to worry about having the right change when you go to this store now. Thank you for doing that, Ray. Is that okay? Can we have fun? Ray's not going to come up here and beat me up. I mean, we're just having fun. But it's true, you know, we get too paranoid and stuff and, and thinking about things that, that might be. And, and let's just have fun. Let's enjoy what God has given us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ray. You didn't know that, that I was going to be preaching about you when you saw me at the bank this week, did you? And it's an interesting thing. I'm going to talk more about that trip to the bank. It was, it was just a little odd. Um, the other thing is I, I want to get into some of the good news. I and mean, we, keep, we keep hearing the bad news and what's going on. I kind of just beat us up with, with COVID a little bit. But I want to tell you some of the good things that are happening because of this COVID. In China, they're ripping down Christian churches. At least that's the news we're getting. And, and you might say, well, Mark, you're hitting us with more bad news. You know what happens every time they rip churches down in China? The gospel explodes and more people turn to Christ. That's what happens. That's what happens when, when they tear churches down in China. Iran, we, we have good friends, that, and this church supports these, these folks. Uh, Cameron and Susie Yari, K&S Ministries. Look them up on, online, see what those guys are doing. It's incredible. Uh, this week, they, they said 4,500 people. There's somewhere there's a call center. They, what Susie and Cameron do is, is they broadcast via satellite into Iran every week. And as they do this, people get saved. Turn their, they're having encounters. Most of these folks that are Muslim are having encounters with Jesus and turning to him and giving their lives to Christ. 4,500 people this week called into their call center to say that they'd accepted Christ. Now, hallelujah, that's right. This is the good stuff that's happening. And, and, and Cameron and Susie are telling us, and they're good friends of us personally, they're telling us that they feel that the number is three times that much because the people are afraid to call into the call center because they might get caught. So even if it's double that, that's 10,000 people in a week, folks. That's stuff to get excited about, right? This is, what, this is what it's about. This is where the rubber meets the road. And, and we're sitting here whining about, you know, having to wear a mask and, and stuff. We've got to get over ourselves and realize it's not about us. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ and people getting their lives turned around and walking with Jesus. Amen? I'm sorry. Am I getting too excited? Calm me down if you need to. I used to say if I'm talking too fast, when we taught in, in, in Asia, if I was talking too fast, wave and, and I'll slow down. So if I see a wave and I'll try and slow down. We, we, my wife and I were blessed. We, we had a business for 20 years, 75 miles west of New York City from Manhattan. And, and a lot of times the customers would come from New York City. So we, we would have to deal with the New York Minute. So that's why I start talking fast because I had to keep up with my customers. I'm just saying, come on. Um, we know that uh, travel restrictions are being lifted. In, in Europe now, you can see the, the restrictions of travel have, have been lifted a little bit. I understand they're still not crazy about Americans. They'll get over that sooner or later. I'm not worried about it. Friend, a friend of ours, a very good friend of ours, missionary to Ukraine, just went back to Ukraine. An awesome young man on fire for God. I know he's going to bring the fire of Jesus to that country. I'm excited for what he's doing there. I'm excited that he's back there. He was stuck here for a long time, and, and he's ready to get back and get his feet wet and, and get into it. So, Lord, we just ask that you touch him today. Touch what you've put in front of him. And many other missionaries are being able to get back on the field where they've been called to, to um, do the work that God has for them, the destinies and the plans that he's got. Um, where the, the COVID death count is dropping, I understand, just about everywhere. Um, and and here's, here's this, you're, you're going to like this one. This, uh, uh, on the, and I love that song that we sang this morning. Um, in California, Governor, uh, what's his name, Gavin Newsom, I think? Did I, get, did I get that right? Declared that there would be no worship or no singing in churches today. That's good news, isn't it? No? Guess what the Bible says about that? Luke 19, 40. I want to read you what it says in Passion Translations. If my fo followers are silent, the very stones will break forth with praises. 
So I thank you, Jesus, that the stones in California begin to shout out your praises. I want to hear the testimonies of the rocks shouting out. We serve a supernatural God. He is not limited by some governor. He is not limited by what the situation is around us. He will make the very rocks shout out if we try to be quiet. Thank you for leading us in that song this morning, David. Thank you for taking us there. Gosh, Jesus, you are a supernatural God. Nothing has changed, and we still serve you, and we're excited about it. We're excited about what you're doing all around the world. Are you with me? Are we getting excited? Amen. You know what? I need to start out with some prayer. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we are your people. We thank you that we can come into this place and worship you this morning, Father, that we can gather together, that we can raise our voices, Lord. But we know, just we just read it according to your word, Lord, that if we don't, the rocks will shout out your praises. And we give you the glory and the honor for that. We thank you for this great nation, Lord, this day that we celebrate our independence, Lord. We just lift up all of those in leadership in this land, Father, that they would be convicted today, Father, to seek after you, to do your will, to bring righteousness to this country, Father. That we would be in unity, Father, not only as a, as a uh, Christian believers, Lord, but you would touch all of our hearts as a nation, Lord. That we would be in unity. We would be in lockstep with what your word says, Lord. That we would speak righteousness, Father. We come against uh, uh, racism, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. This, 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 this attack of the enemy that's been hurting our nation, Father. Where racism exists, Lord, we speak light and life and joy and unity into those places, Father. We not, we're not sticking our heads in the sand, Lord. We know there is racism, Lord. But, Lord, if it's in us, we just ask your forgiveness. And we ask that you take us to a place where it doesn't exist, where we see people as your children. Lord, because that's what we are. We're all your sons and daughters. Even when we're backslidden or making mistakes or making poor choices or whatever you want to call it, but we know that we are your children and that you have created us and you have a plan and a destiny for this nation, for this people, Lord. Help us to be a bride that is spotless, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for every opportunity that you give us to release your light into this world. Help us to bring grace, mercy, and joy, Father, according to your word and your will. In the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We need that. We need unity. We need to be together. You know, it's, it's hard sometimes. It's difficult. I know I'm, I'm, I'll be the first one to raise my hand and my daughter is here this morning and she'll second that, 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 you know, I don't get, I'm, I'm too conservative. I don't have any progressive ideas, but we, we still need to be in, in agreement. We still need to be in unity. We still need to get together and, and to face things as, as one nation, as one people as one group of believers, no matter we're in this church, and I made fun already of Baptist pastors, you guys that are Baptist pastors, please forgive me. I love you guys. I do, I do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I want, I want us to, this morning, my lesson, what I want to talk about is the prophet some of the Old Testament prophets. Mainly, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about Ezra. So, if you're in the Word and you want to look, we're going to most of our text this morning is going to come out of Ezra. He is is one of the uh, the prophets that, that prophesied to Israel um, at the time of their return from exile. And, and I want to share with you. Did I bring my bottle of water up, or did I forget it? I thought I had my bottle. Thank you, sir. I, Anyway, um, what, what, what my wife and I think, yeah, that's awesome. What my wife and I learned from one of our mentors or from several of our mentors over the years, it, when you study the Bible, this is, this is some of the things that, that we look at, that, that we try to uh, t tackle. And, and that is what, you know, when you look at, at Ezra, you, you think this, this guy was 500 years before Christ we're 2,000 removed from the days that Jesus walked on this earth. What in the world could possibly be the same between 2,500 years ago and today, right? 
You think the, the earth and, and the things in the world has changed a lot in 2,500 years, right? If they wanted to go visit somebody, uh, they, they walked. You know, it's amazing. You read some of the stories in the New Testament. Jesus, one time, he walked up to Tyre and Sidon. He prayed for the lady. He released healing to the lady after he spoke nastily to her. Uh, the Samaritan woman who, who uh, wanted healing for her daughter talked about uh, uh, how she could have the crumbs that dogs would have. And, and because of her faith, her, the daughter was healed. When, when you take that story in context, you see that Jesus actually walked 50 miles to that place. That's the only recorded thing that happened there. It's the only thing that gets recorded in that whole 50-mile journey. And then he goes back to the next place where he just came from. You know, I, I, I got to I, I, I uh, um, repent. There's times I won't stop my car and drive across the street to pray for somebody. Am I the only one? You know, I, I, I see somebody in, you know, with a flat tire or something, I, and, I, and I see they're on their cell phone, so I don't stop. I just keep driving. Jesus walked 50 miles, and all he did, and, and really, you know, that, that story used to offend me because I, I thought he treated her very poorly. It doesn't matter. He healed her daughter. We, we need to stop the car and walk across the street, whatever it is, whatever the situation is. And, and I'm confessing, yes, you know, I'm, I've made that mistake. When I catch myself doing it and it's too late to go back, I just, I, and God is so faithful with this. I've done it so many times. I just repent and say, Jesus, I missed that one. Forgive me, Lord. Don't let me miss the next one. And almost every time I do that, he gives me the next opportunity almost instantly. It's crazy. And, and it's, it's like, the, it's, 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 it's so much the same thing. If I miss some, saying something to somebody, putting fuel in my truck at the gas station, the next time Jesus releases something to be putting fuel in, at the fueling station. It's, it's amazing if we just talk to him. You know, that's what it's about. It's about relationship and talking to Jesus. If we talk to him, he'll talk back. He'll forgive us. He forgives me when I miss that person on the side of the road. He forgives you when you miss that person. And I don't, you know, maybe you don't even drive. My, my point here was the comparison of, of how much things have changed. You know, we want to go somewhere, we get in the car and drive. Jesus walked 2,500 years ago. What was going on in, in Israel? What was happening in, with, with uh, uh, the Jews in, in, in exile at that point in time? Well, we need to make that comparison. We need to ask a few other questions. We need to you know, say, what, what's the cultural, political, and economic situation of that time? Ignore the changes. Ignore the cell phones. Ignore those things and just pay attention to the cultural, economic uh, things that were going on in that time. And, and then ask, how do those situations in those times relate to what's happening to us today? You think things are new, that, that people are inventing new ideas and new things? Yeah, God gave us an imagination and he blesses us when we run after him and, and we have new ideas and we get to do new things but many of that stuff is, is just a repeat of what's already gone on in the Bible. The, the cultural, political, economic stuff that's going on today has gone on before and it will go on again. How do these things, we have to ask ourselves, how do these things affect our relationship with God? How does it affect my walk, our walk? And if we make it personal, God will make it personal. And that's what it's supposed to be. Our relationship is, is our relationship. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not mine. I can say some beautiful words and, or I can say some silly words today, but it's about what you talk to Jesus about. It's about your personal relationship. Can somebody smile? I'm not, I'm not trying to beat you up. Listen, that's the last thing. I want to encourage you. I want us to leave here edified and lifted up. You know, maybe I'll teach you something. Maybe I'm not smart enough to because I'm really not much of a uh, uh, theologian. If you, try to, if you came here this morning to get a good theological teaching, you came to the wrong church. Just saying. Um, but I hope it's sound. I believe it is. I believe it's what God wants me to teach on this morning. So I want to take us down the road of, of some of these characters that I'm going to talk about. Ezra. We all know he's a prophet, right? But he was a priest and a teacher of the law 
who helped in leading the, the return of the exiles, right? We all know them. All you guys are, are, are students of the Bible. You're all getting in there. Or are we in that flyover territory? We, we did a Bible study last spring, and one of the guys made the comment that, that we were in, in looking at the flyover books of the Bible. So we're going to jump into some of this flyover stuff and see what God was doing. Because if, 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 if President Trump could stop in those flyover states and change things in this country, let's go look at these flyover prophets and see if we can change some things in our lives. Change some things in the way the body of believers gets viewed by the rest of the world. Instead of them thinking as, of us as closed-minded and, and non-progressive, let's show them that, that we are progressive, that we do uh, stand for change. We do stand to see things get better in this world. And that's what Ezra was doing. He was encouraging the, the, the believers to go back and, and restore the city. Uh, I'm also going to touch on Haggai. He was one of those really minor prophets. His, his, his book in the Bible was two chapters long, but I love it. God has taken some stuff out of that book of Haggai and seared it on my heart. I can't get it out of my mind. It's important stuff. It's there for a reason and a purpose. And God has used it. He's changing things in me. And I think he's going to make changes in the world because of what he's seared into me. And I thank you for that, Jesus. I thank you for taking me down that road. We're going to talk about this guy, Zerubbabel. I love that name. Just kind of rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? Zerubbabel. Anybody ever name your child Zerubbabel? Anybody got that a grandchild or something? Nobody wants to use that name? It's an interesting name. Um, it's, it's actually, uh, from what I understand, it's a Babylonian name, but the man, Zerubbabel, is an Israelite. As a matter of fact, he's in the line of David. Also, if you read the New Testament, He's in the line of Jesus. So it's not a mistake. It's not an accident that this guy's in there. Zerubbabel is an important character. And we're going to learn a little about him. He's actually, he was never king. Who was it? Jehoiada was, was the, uh, the last official king that was in the Davidic line. But then this guy Zerubbabel comes along after the exile, gets sent back by the Babylonians as the political overseer of that area, of Jerusalem. So while he wasn't the king, he was the political leader of the people of Israel. He's the last unofficial leader, political leader of the, actually not unofficial, official leader of the Israelites. In, in the political setting. And, and we're, we're also going to talk about this guy. Uh, they, they, his name is, is translated a couple different ways, but it's Joshua. Joshua is, is the high priest. He was never the high priest before the exile. His grandfather was the high priest at the exile. Is that fireworks? Or is that me holding the microphone too close? It might be fireworks. It is Fourth of July weekend. Okay, so Joshua never, uh, before the exile, never was the high priest, but he's trained to be the high priest. During the exile in Babylon, his, his father is raising him up that when they return, that he will be the high priest. Joshua knows that. When he gets back there, he knows that's his job. He knows that that's what he's got to do. He's got to lead the people in worship. He's got to lead them back into relationship. Okay, who else did I? Zechariah. Zechariah is, is the, the book right after um, Haggai. Zechariah was, was a prophet. He's the son of Idu. He's a seer. And, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, folks, I, I can relate to a lot of these guys, and some of them I struggle with. It's, it's that way in life, right? We, we meet some folks that it's easy to get along with. We, we, we're like-minded. We think the same. But there's other times where people, they may be believers, but they just think differently than us. And it's, and it's hard to get a mindset to understand where they're coming from. That's how I was with Zechariah. Zechariah, if you read the book of Zechariah, he has these crazy apocalyptic dreams of, of just wild and crazy things. And, and that just is not my mindset. You know, I'm more practical. I, I, some of these minor prophets were farmers. I can relate to those guys. 
I, I grew up in the Garden State picking peaches and strawberries. So it's easier for me to understand where they're coming from. But when you start talking about these pictures like Zechariah, these dreams that he has and the things that he sees, the myrtle trees and, and the, all the stuff that comes out of, out of his dreams, it's, it, it just... I have to really slow down and pay attention to that stuff to, to get a, a meaning to relate to it. But he's also a, a prophet at that time. And I'm also going to touch on Daniel. We all know Daniel, right? The lion's den. Cool story, right? All right. So this is the time of the return of the exile. It's about 538 B.C. There's 50,000 Israelites return. About 7,000, this was just a little thing that caught my eye. About 7,000 of them were slaves. It, it never occurred to me that the Israelites were bringing back slaves with them. They, they spent 70 years in exile and they still have slaves. You know, part of some of the issues that, that we're facing in this nation is because we allowed uh, slavery to come into part of this country at one time. And, and here these guys are bringing it back after 70 years of exile. I don't know what that means. I don't know how that stacks up. I just thought it was interesting, so I'm mentioning it. You can think about it, pray about it, and if God gives you something, let me know. Because, you know, we're all in this together. It's not about just what I can teach you. I, I love that, is Jay here today? I don't see him. He's not here. I love that Jay stepped up and, and, and offered to teach this class starting next week. We need to have diversity in everything. We need to have different people being willing. You know, don't worry about if, if you think you can't do it well enough. Don't worry about if somebody might not like what you say. Don't worry. Don't be concerned if somebody corrects you. It's okay to be corrected. We're all children of God. It's all right if, if I say something wrong today and pastor calls me up next week and says, hey, Mark, you shouldn't have said that. It's okay. We all need to learn. But if we don't step out and try it, we're going to be stuck in second gear. We're not going to get anywhere. We might be roaring around with our engine screaming, but we're going to get there slowly. Let's, let's shift the gear. Let's take the chance. Uh, Nancy, my wife and I, my, my wife is over here... Um, I, we were blessed to, to, to come up and, and, and go through a, a ministry school under Randy Clark. And, and one of the things that they teach is faith is spelled R-I-S-K. If you're not willing to take a risk, do you really have faith? You know, if that, if that Samaritan woman wasn't willing to go into the room and, and, and beg for the crumbs off the table, and she didn't take that risk, would her daughter have been healed? You know, let's, let's take a risk from time to time, folks. You know, uh, uh, people look at my wife and I, and, and I'm telling you, we, we've been blessed. We've been able to travel all around the world. We, we've spoken at, at, at churches in, in, from Russia to, to Africa, from China to Mongolia to Siberia, and, and, and we love it. But if you knew us, if you knew us individually, we'd still be stuck in the Garden State picking strawberries and peaches, folks. Together, God has done something with us that I couldn't, I never even dreamed that I've been to the places. And if it sounds like I'm bragging, I am. I'm bragging on my Lord Jesus. I'm bragging that he's drug us to these places. You know, it's, it's exciting. Alex has been with me. We, we've sat there and preached, and, and we were wondering if the roaches were going to carry our bags off of the table in front of us. You know, it's, it, it may sound scary in the moment to get drug out of an airport at, at gunpoint, but it's exciting. You know, one of our things when we first got married was our favorite dream, our favorite theme. Let's fly away. What are we doing, folks? Let's fly away. Let's go for it. It doesn't matter. You know, listen, you, you, you might not like to fly, but drive across town. Ask God. Get up in the morning and say, God, what is it today? Who is it that needs ministry? Who needs a word of encouragement today that I can be part of, Lord? How can you use me today? If we ask, he's going to be faithful and talk to us. But we've got to work on that part of it. We've got to get it done. He's coming back, and, and he, he's, he wants to come back to a bride that's spotless. That's how we get spotless. We admit it when we miss something. We ask, her, we ask for uh, forgiveness. It's easy to do. He loves it when we're, when we're pliable like that, when we're willing to bend and real, recognize that we messed up. 
Hurting people need Jesus. Hurting people have been hurt. Sometimes they've been hurt by us. So we got to admit it and move on. Ask for forgiveness and, and show grace and mercy. Okay, <clears throat> these exiles are heading back. Within months, they do what they're told. They begin on, uh, in the beginning of Ezra, they begin on restoring the temple. Before they build the, do anything on the temple, they set up the altar and get that rebuilt. And within months, they're, taking, they're uh, doing sacrifices and offerings and worshiping the Lord before they even start on the foundation. It took two years for them to get started on the foundation from that point. And then they paid for people to come and, and start working on it. When the foundation was completed in Ezra 4.1, they rejoice and, ex and accept the, uh, and, and, and worship over the foundation. Just the foundation is done. Now, I wasn't part of this church when the foundation was dug and the, and the stones were put in the ground and the cement was poured. If you were here, I'd love to hear some of those stories sometimes because I love building. I love construction and seeing things. I love seeing old things. My wife and I spent a long time um, restoring old houses and flipping them. It was nothing like taking an old rundown place and bringing it into the grandeur of what it could have been, should have been, and was at one point in time, and returning it to that and seeing a family move in and, and enjoy life in that place. And, and that's how it is. You know, we need to do that with people. We need to pour into people and that, that are run down and beat up and been hurt by life and pour into them and restore them and just pour over them. Just invite them to your house, whatever it takes, whatever it looks like. Go have a sandwich with them. Have lunch with somebody. Have breakfast. If you can't afford it, invite them to your house and make an egg. How much does an egg cost? But if there's people that are lonely and hurting, invite them to your house. If you're lonely and hurting, invite somebody to your house. We have to take responsibility. You know, sometimes I, I sit there and I say, you know, we, we moved here and, 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 you know, our neighbors are nice and everything, but they've never had us over for dinner. What, what's with that, Jesus? And then he says, did you have them over for dinner? It's humbling. It can be very humbling. But we need to be willing to do that. We need to be willing. And it doesn't matter if they don't invite you back. That's not the point of it. It's not about you. It's about that person. It's about the other folks. It's about building the kingdom back up no matter what it looks like. It's, it's not about getting a check mark or, or, or getting credit for that or getting reinvited out to dinner somewhere else. It's about restoring those people that need restoration in the kingdom. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what their situation is. If they're hurting, we need to step in and do something and just ask God where we and how we can go about doing that to make the most impact for the kingdom. And as a reform one, the economics, or I'm sorry, the enemies of Judah and, and Benjamin come and ask Zerubbabel to let them help in rebuilding the temple. Now this sounds weird. The enemy comes and ask to help with the rebuilding of the temple. And you think about that and you think, are they enemies or are they frenemies? Are they friends or are they enemies? Why wouldn't you want them to help? If, if, you're, if part of the problem is you don't, you don't have enough workers and somebody comes and wants to help, why don't you let them? But the Israelites say no. They recognize that these guys are serving many other gods. There's a reason for it. There's a reason they have to say no. And there's times in our lives where we, get, we need to be in that situation. We need to discern that we're in that situation. Someone is coming to help. Maybe it's somebody comes to the church and they, want, and they start becoming part of the church and they, they want to take over something. But there's, a, there's an underlying plan. We need to discern when to say no. You know, my wife and I said in this church, this is the first time I'm preaching the entire Sunday sermon. We've been here for four years. We've been missionaries all around the world. We, we've gone to, to ministry school. But I didn't, we didn't walk in here and say, Pastor, you need to give, me, give us the microphone. You know, we need to discern when somebody comes in and says, I got a word from God. If that's somebody new in the building... We need to make sure, we need to discern before they get the microphone. And, and if you're here this morning and you've got a word from God, 
I'm going to tell you something. I'm a guest. I'm, I'm allowed this privilege of coming up in the front and speaking. I don't, I don't take that lightly, and I thank Pastor David for calling on me to do this today. But if you've got a word, you're going to need to bring it to Pastor David and then and let him address it. I, I cannot do that. I, I'm not, I, I will take that responsibility very seriously. If, if you've got a word, you pass it through the leadership, and then the, the, the leadership makes that decision. I am not the leader in this church. I'm just a man with a microphone this morning. So if that's, if that's you and you happen to have a word today, I'm sorry, it's lunch. I love you guys. I really do. But it's lunch today. All right? Forgive me. Um, the enemies of Judah are told no. They're refused. And guess what happens? They get angry, and they go back to the king. And they start making problems. They, they start paying people. They start bribing people to make it difficult for those that would help, the, that, that, are, that are doing the work of God and rebuilding the temple. They, they, they just stir up all kinds of trouble. Have you ever had that happen in your life where somebody starts stirring up trouble? You don't even know why. And they just start spreading rumors or saying little things that come back and, and cause you problems. It's not new stuff. This stuff went on. You know, there's, there's discouragement. They're, they're insulting the people. They're bribing the officials. Then they go back and, and they lodge a complaint. And this is so cool. The, the complaint they go back, that they take back to the, to the king, is half the story. They go back with half the story. They go back and they, they write this beautiful letter. They, they praise the king and tell him how great and wonderful and, and how we're your loyal subjects. And then they say, you got these guys over in Israel that have this history of being rebellious, that are rebuilding the temple, that are rebuilding the city. And we don't want them to get too ahead of themselves and become rebellious to you because we love you, king. Do you think those guys really loved the king? No, they were stirring up trouble. They told half the story. You know, it's not false, right? We know the history of the Israelites. They were rebellious. They didn't. That's why they're in exile. They were rebellious to God, right? You, you can't say they're not rebellious. It is true. That's half the story, though. Half the story is what, guys? Anybody know what the half the story is? What? Now, there's something else we call it today. What do we call it? Fake news. <laughs> I told you we were going to have some fun. might be just a little bit. I didn't say my jokes were good. And it's not a joke, though. It's true. You know, we listen to the news sometimes, and we get half the story. And you scratch your head, and you go, there's got to be more to that, but I don't have the time to figure it out. It's not my job to figure it out. I just know that it's not right, because I can tell it's only part of the story. You know, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It is right. The Jews were, the Jewish people did have a history of being rebellious to God and to the other nations around them, to the king, all these other people, they've been rebellious. It's a true story, but there's more to the story. The story was that, that they had favor because of this guy Daniel I mentioned. Daniel in, in the lion's den, remember? Here, I want to read that to you. And this comes from Daniel 6, verse 25. This is what Darius, the king, speaks after Daniel comes out of the lion's den. Now, you have to understand something here. Somebody, uh, Dylan mentioned uh, uh, all the Indian folks that, that live in, in um, South Africa. Um, Dave and Jody, um, minister in, in India, uh, they spend a couple months a year, every year in India, working with youth or uh, young people, orphans, and, and, and helping build the kingdom of God in, in India. Darius, at this point in time, his kingdom includes India all the way up through the Mediterranean area. It's, it's almost the whole known world at that time that this guy is the king of, okay? And this is the decree right here that, that he speaks. If you go back, our friends Cameron and Susie will tell you that, that this, this guy, Darius, is a respected, even to today, part of their history. 
He is somebody, when you talk to them, when, when they speak to the Iranian people, they often mention this guy because they know the respect that they have for this king that was, in, that was the leader of them at that time. This is what he says. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, my people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Does that decree, decree end? Is there, does, it, does it say it was only for Daniel in that time? Does it say that, that that decree is only until the exiles return to Israel? Absolutely not. That's still for today. All of those two people in that part of the world are still living under that decree. Those words don't go away. They don't end. They're, they're not part-time words. This book that we read, this Bible that we have, was for then it's for now and it's for tomorrow. It doesn't end. It doesn't pass away. Those words, that decree is still effective, guys. Is that cool or what? Those people are still living under that. And so are we because we are part of God's family. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, my people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Here's another really cool thing. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders. You know, I, I've, I've read this decree many times. I love this thing, but I, I, I mentally was not catching this. He performs signs and wonders. You know, we, uh, my, my wife talked with a, 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 a relative a, 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 by marriage, a family member this week, and, and, the, and this person mentioned that... Um, Signs and wonders weren't for today, that, that healing wasn't for today, that it was for, you know, the, the, uh, the disciples. And, and I just look at this and go, did it end? Did, does this decree end? Where, where did that come from? How do we get to that point where we, that we allow that cloak to come over our eyes, that we don't believe signs and wonders are for today? I see signs and wonders all the time. When, when God decrees and declares something over you folks, it doesn't end. You know, I told you, my wife and I are very blessed. We're incredibly blessed. We, we, we have this beautiful lodge. We, we never came here with these ideas in our head. God just has put this stuff in our lap, and, and we've been obedient to run after it, and, and, and he's blessed us mightily beyond what we could dream or imagine. But we went, we, we had a prophetic word spoken over us uh, just over a year ago that we were to buy this particular lodge, and, 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 and we just, you know, the, the prophetic man, and, and we didn't really know who he was. We looked, found later that he, he has a very prophetic voice, and, and we had confirmation of the exact same words, but one of the things he said was, don't worry about the financing, the money will come, and we, we stood on that because we didn't have the money. We didn't have the financing. We had four banks turn us down. There's no way that these things should have happened, but God, God is faithful to his word, and, and, and then we get there, February 28th, we, cl we close, we buy this property, 28th of, of February this year. What happened March 15th, everybody? The country shut down, COVID. Did God's word end when we closed on that property? To not worry about the finances? Should we be concerned? No. It's the same thing here. This word that, that's been spoken over the, the land over the people is still in effect. Those people are still being blessed today. This revival that's going on in, in, um, in Iran is incredible. This isn't just overnight, it's, it's on fire. It's, it's a baptism of, of, of the Holy Spirit through personal experiences of Jesus walking into their bedrooms and talking to folks. And you're never gonna change that relationship when Jesus comes and sees them face to face. I don't care what country you're living in and where you're at. I don't care what the government says. You're not going to change that really. You have a personal encounter, and God's going to change things in your life. 
You might make, it doesn't mean you're perfect. You might make mistakes yet. They don't have it all down. But are we really ready for it? You know, I, I've been hearing people for, for, since we came back from overseas in, in 2009, you know, that they want revival in the land, that we, that we need revival in this country. Everybody's, yay, let's have revival. Went to ministry school and, and everybody's on fire for revival. Are we really? Revival's messy. Somebody was, I forget who, was here from, from outside of Toronto. What, what happened in Toronto? The, 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 uh, the, the revival in, in Toronto with, with Randy Clark and those guys. I mean, we're familiar with it. But what happened immediately through that process? The church in there got disassociated with uh, the vineyard movement. They were part of Vineyard, and, and, they were, and they were tossed because of some of the things that were going on. It gets sloppy, guys. It gets messy. Are we really ready for that? We have some good friends, or not good friends, folks that we just met this week that, that are in need of a covering. They, they're from a little church, in, in they, a church plant that they started in Jonesboro, Arkansas. It's known as the City of Churches. And revival has broken out in that little city, in that little startup church. They have to, it's a breakdown setup church. They, I don't know where they're, what building they're in or what they're renting, but they're coming into this place and they have to set up chairs and take them down every week. And revival is broken out. And that's awesome, isn't it? Exciting that a city that's, that's built on churches, they got more churches than we have here in that city. There's more churches per capita in that city than any place else is, is what they were telling us. And guess what happened? Revival is breaking out, but guess what happened? They're covering their church from, from back home where they're from has asked them to pray about stepping out from under their covering. They don't know about this strange fire that's going on there. What does that mean? I don't know if they're trying to control it. They're, not kind of, they're, they're, they're willing to walk away from it rather than get involved with it. Revival can be messy. Don Potter told me a story about one of the great revivalists that, that in one of his meetings, peop, uh, two, two or three drunks came up and started arguing and fighting and, and heckling him while he's trying to preach the word of God during a revival. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not some incredibly gifted, talented speaker. If I was, you'd be hearing about me instead of seeing me, but I'm what you got today. But, but if... If I was, and this room was full of people that were amen and, and, and yelp, jumping up and down and on fire for God, not that you're not, and, and all of a sudden three drunks walk in and start heckling me and, and chewing me out and cursing at me and saying all kinds of nasty things, and, and maybe you're thinking of saying them to me now because you don't like what I'm saying, I don't know, but what if that happened? What would I do? I don't know. I don't know how I react. This man of God that, that's, that's running this revival that God's put in place and in charge in that moment in time that spent the hours and days and months and weeks and years in prayer to get to that point has these drunks in front of him in this moment in time heckling him and telling him he, he's cursed and he's no good and he's that and the other thing. And he just stands there quietly and takes it. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to, to, to stand there quietly and take it if somebody tells us in Walmart that we're just crazy Christians? Are we willing to do that? This man just stood there quietly and took it until Holy Spirit told him, you need to warn these men. They will not live through this night if they don't stop this now. And he spoke that out over those men. Those men continued for 20 minutes or something, continued to heckle him, curse him, and tell him he was no good. They eventually did leave. They walked across the street to the bar. And one man had a heart attack sitting on the bar stool and died. The other man thought, maybe I should run back and confess. And he walked across the street and was hit by a car and died. Revival can be messy. Are we really, really ready for it? Do we really know what it looks like? Are we prepared? Are we willing to take the heckling and then listen to the Holy Spirit and speak up when the Holy Spirit gives it to us? Are we ready for that? But what if it looks different? What if it doesn't look anything like Toronto? What if it's completely different? What if it breaks out at a, at a baseball game? 
What, what if it's completely something we have no grid for? Are we ready for that? Are we willing to step into it when that moment happens? If we won't stop the car and offer to help the lady with a flat tire fix her tire, are we really ready for revival? We better get there because that's what Jesus is coming back for, that church, that church. All right, I got to get moving here because I do. All right, where are we at? We finished with the fake news. The work stops because of this bad report that these guys go back because they did, you know, it was true. The, the, the Israelites were rebellious and, and the king doesn't check any further. So then you get, uh, later you get Haggai in, in Ezra 5. Haggai and Zechariah prophesy over Zerubbabel and Joshua and the work begins on the temple and within in two months, they've got the foundation laid. You know, there's all kinds of things that are going on in this place at this time. You have to understand this. There's, this, there's the, these 50,000 people or whatever it was that, that, that have come back from exile. Or have come back into a desert land. A land that's been 70 years without being planted, tilled, or cared for. It's a mess. When, before they left, the, the Babylonians destroyed everything. The temple's ripped completely down. The foundation is gone. So when they rebuild this temple, when they get the foundation done, there's joy in the land, but there's also crying. There's tears because this new foundation is much smaller than the old foundation. And those that, were, that are there now that have returned, those that were children that saw the old temple now see this foundation. And, and it's like they see this foundation when this was what the temple was before. And while everybody's in joy because this is done, those guys are crying out to God because they know it's so much smaller. But you know what's interesting is that temple, even though it was smaller, it stood longer than Solomon's temple in all of its grandeur. That temple, that rebuilt temple, stood longer than the original did. It's interesting how God will do these things, isn't it? Maybe it doesn't mean anything to anybody, but maybe there's somebody here that that's important to know this morning, that what you're doing might be smaller than what those that went before you did, but that what you're doing will stay longer than what those that went before you, if you will honor those people, if we will honor those who go before us and stand on their shoulders, God will honor us. And even if what we do isn't so great, it will stand. It'll stand the test of time. Haggai reports of the deplorable situation that's going on there in the land. Of how awful things are, how the crops are failing. There's lack in almost everything, in finances, in food, in housing, everything. There's not enough of it. It's a deplorable situation. We've heard that term before, right? It's nothing new, folks. It's nothing new. I, I often think when you see these new movies come out that... that are, uh, uh, you know, um, what are they, sci fi or whatever they are? I think these guys just read the Bible finally. That's where they got their ideas from. It's nothing new. You look at some of the stuff that goes on in some of these movies, and, and you'll find it in the Bible. You know, save the $12 to go to the movie and, and read the Bible. You'll get the story. I'm, I'm just saying. All right. So then. Haggai encourages these guys to get back to work. And, and then these guys, Tatanai and associates is what I call them. It's Tatanai that lives in the area outside of the, the city of Jerusalem. He goes back to Darius again and says, hey, this city of, rebellion, of rebellions or of, re, of these bad cats are, are starting up again. Before that, he goes to them and he says, who told you to do that? Because now you understand that, that they were told to stop and now they've started, they, and they did stop for a while, but now Haggai and Zechariah encourage them. They get a word from the Lord, and I love it when they get a word from the Lord. If you read their word from the Lord, they don't just say, this is a word from the Lord. They say, this is a word from the Lord of heaven's armies. Not singular army, but armies. How do they know that? How do they recognize that, it's, that he's the Lord of heaven's armies? I mean, we can sit here and say it. I can say it. But have I been to heaven and seen heaven's armies that I know he's the Lord of? I think these guys were. We need to spend that time in the presence so we can see heaven's armies. How do we do that? What does that look like? 
Ask them, what does it look like, Jesus? What does the heaven's armies look like? Can you show them to me, God? Do you think he's going to say no? No, I don't think he's going to say no. Thank you. I think he's going to say yes. Here they are. Come with me. I will show you great and mighty things. That's how he is. That's what he wants to do with us today. He wants to show us great and mighty things. I think these guys saw it. So they come with this word of the Lord. And, the, and Zerubbabel and, and uh, Joshua, they pick up the, the, the tools again. And they get back to work on the temple. And then Tatanai comes and says, who gave you this permission? And I love this. I love what he says. I love what the response is. It's in uh, Ezra 5. Ezra 5.11, this is what it says. The God, Tath and I ask who gave some permission. And their answer is, the God of heaven and earth. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a line. We are the servants of God of heaven and earth. But our ancestors sinned against him and he sent them into exile to Babylon. And we are the ones that have gone back to work to rebuilding the temple. They didn't say, Joshua and Zerubbabel, they didn't all point at those guys. They said, we are the sons of God of heaven and earth. And our ancestors sinned. What does that mean? It means they confessed the wrong things that their people, their nation, their ancestors had done wrong. They took responsibility. Jerry said this a couple of weeks ago. We will never have authority over that which we don't take responsibility for. What does that look like, Jesus? What does that look like? It means we will never have authority over, I don't know, pick something, burning of the cities. We will never have authority over burning of our cities and rioting that's going on if we don't take authority. We will never have that authority if we don't take the responsibility. How do we take the responsibility? Lord, forgive us. It's very simple. Lord, that's our sin. That's on us. Destroying other people's property, tearing things down that don't belong to us, destroying other people's lives is us. Lord, forgive us. We take on that responsibility right now. That's on us. We've got to do a better job, Jesus, of taking responsibility, whatever it looks like, Jesus, ever how we have to do it. We take it right now, Jesus. We're at fault. We've sinned. We've stood by. We've said nothing. We've allowed racism to go on. We've done nothing about it. We've got to change, Jesus. Forgive us. We are responsible. We ask you. We lay it at the foot of the cross. Forgive us. And he did. He died on that cross so that we would have, and by taking responsibility for our sins to give us the authority over them. Right? We've got authority over our sins because Jesus took responsibility for them, but we still need to take responsibility if we want to have authority over what happens in our city, our state, our country. We're responsible. And if we're not, we're not going to have authority. Amen? Are we awake? Am I boring you yet? I hope not, because I want to encourage you. I want to, by the time I finish, I want you to be lit up and ready to, to be on fire for Jesus. Again, they go back with half truths. They did start rebuilding the temple. More fake news. They're back with that story. Darius checks the record this time and checks it more thoroughly. And he comes back and he realizes, hey, guys, they were told to go back and rebuild that temple. Cyrus sent them there to rebuild the temple. Not only that, Tatanai and your associates and all the nonsense you're trying to throw against them, recognize what it says, what Cyrus told them to do. You guys, you're to collect your tax money and give it to those guys to build the temple with. Your tribute needs to go there so that they can rebuild the temple. Not only that, you need to take them some animals to sacrifice. You've got to give them everything they need to restore that temple, to rebuild it, to have so that sacrifice and worship of the God of Israel can reside in that place. It's your job. You're trying to point the finger at them. Now it's come back on you. 
What's going on in the land, folks? What's going on in the land? Justice? We got to take responsibility for it. We can't say, why isn't the government doing something about this? We need to get on our knees and take responsibility for what's going on and ask God to forgive us, forgive us as believers, forgive us as a nation to get back to the place where we need to be to get right with God because that's what it's about. Right? What's the temple? You're the temple, we're the temple, but what's our temple? What's that temple re- represent? It re- represents the relationship. It represents our relationship with Jesus, with Holy Spirit, with God the Father. That's what the temple here is representing, folks. It's not just the building, it's not just this wonderful building that we're in with the air conditioning, and I'm so glad because it's hot outside. I think this is the first summer we've been in, in North Carolina. We, we've been here for four years now, and, and this time last year we were in Kenya for a month. Yeah, we just seem to get out of here in the summertime. This year we're, it looks like we're going to be here. It's not the building, though. It's the relationship. So when Zerubbabel and Joshua are given the prophetic word that they are to encourage the people to rebuild, to redo, to, to restore the temple and the worship there. They are, their job is to encourage the believers. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. I want to encourage you to rebuild your relationship with God the Father, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Talk to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, what have you got for me today? It's a beautiful, gorgeous day. What do you want me to do today? And be obedient to it, whatever it is, whether it's wear a red tie and a white shirt and blue pants, whatever it is, those little things make a difference. We need to be obedient to it. We need to get ourselves in gear, folks. We need to engage the Holy Spirit and step into it. And if we can do that, what Darius decreed is gonna follow us all of our days. Because that word was not for temporary. What Darius decreed over the land is for us. Amen? So can we do that? Can we get back into to being obedient? You know, Haggai and Zechariah, these guys, our choices are important and obedience in us is part of God's plan in the world. Our obedience in humility and action will change things in the world. Does that make sense? You need me to say it again? Let me say it again. Our choices are important. Obedience in us is part of God's plan in the world. Our obedience in in humility and action changes things in the world. Two parts of that, humility and action. We serve, how can we serve a supernatural God that works in signs and wonders if we won't get up out of the easy chair? It takes action, it takes action We've got to move. We need to do it in humility, yes, but we need to do it. Almost finished, folks. <clears throat> Spiritual restoration, our restoration with God, our relationship with God must precede political restoration in the land. Amen? Yeah. Is that important stuff or what? If we expect the political restoration in this land... We better take action. We better get our relationship back in order. God's presence is key to restoration. The the importance of this temple is that restoration of relationship. That's so important. Now, one of the other things that, that this guy... Hey guys, what a name, huh? Hey guy, that's another one we didn't hang on anybody's kids, right? Anybody name their kids? Hey guy, anybody know anybody named Hey guy? You might. I mean, we've seen some, heard some, some uh, really uh, um, in, in Africa and in different places. We hear some names that are really wild. Zerubbabel is not the hardest name I've ever had to say. Hey guy, he tells these guys. And, and those of you that were in my Bible class know this. Hey, guy tells these guys, if you will do this thing 
And I want to speak that over every one of you here today. This is what I want to pray over you right now. That if you will do this thing, that the Lord of heaven's armies will make you his signet ring. Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, the religious leader, and the political leader, if you guys will do this thing, and maybe some of you guys are political leaders, I don't know, maybe you're called to be, and you haven't stepped into it yet, but if you are, I want to encourage you to step into it. If you're called to be a religious leader, a, a Christian leader, then step into it. If you're called to do these things, do them. If we will step into these things, if you and I will step into these things, God will make you and me, us, his signet ring. Everybody know what a signet ring is? It's a seal. It's a seal. There were three kinds of seals that were being used in that time. One was a stamp, you know, like a rubber stamp kind of thing where you stamp the seal and that made it official. There was another kind, it was called the cylindrical seal. It was like the cylinder thing on a stone that was pretty important. And then there was the ring, the signet ring. And, and you know, it's, it's you know, again, I want to compare it to today. Uh, my wife and I, we, we had some uh, um, things that we needed to sell. And, and in order to do that, we needed to have what's called a medallion seal. Does anybody know what a medallion seal is? If you do, you're better than me because we've got, had to get one two or three times in our lives. And I still don't understand the significance of it. But if, if, if you have something important... And, and if you want to write a check out, you, 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 one of the ways you do that is you sign your name, right? Your, your, your signature is your seal. If you have something that's more important and it needs to be witnessed, you go and you get somebody who's what? A notary. And you have that form notarized and, and it, it gets that seal on it, that stamp. If you're a corporation and, and you uh, make a corporate decision to buy, sell, whatever you're doing in your corporation, you have a corporate seal and you put that corporate seal on it. And that seals the deal. A, a medallion, I, I think it has because of a, a certain amount of value or something, and, and there wasn't much value in this thing, but they required us to, to have this seal, and that was why the pain, that's why we ran into Ray at the bank, was getting the seal. It's a different seal, and each one is a little, has a little bit of a different meaning and a different significance, right? So you've got these three seals that are being used in the land of Babylon at that time. You've got the cylindrical seal, which is really official. It's this heavy stone thing. Then you've got the little rubber stampy thing. And then you've got the king's signet ring. What's the significance of that, do you think? It's got authority. All three had authority. So it's a little more than that. Here's the deal, guys. When you sign your name, and it's just you signing your name, if, if you are a person of integrity... And, and you're going to back it up, you're going to sign your name to that check. And when, that, when the person you're giving that check to goes to the bank to get the cash for it, you could, because you're someone of integrity, they're getting the cash, right? But it's personal. That's the difference. The ring the king carried on his finger. It was personal. The king knew about it. It wasn't some law that the, the governors or, or the sat traps or whatever they called them at that time set up. It was personal. The king knew about it. So here you got these two guys, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the political leader, the religious leader. God says to them, the God of heaven's army says to them, if you will do this thing and encourage my people back to a place of relationship, of getting right with me, I will make you my signet ring. It's personal, guys. Our relationship will be built and we'll have the authority to carry around. You had to be somebody in, very, very entrusted to be a very trusted, uh, reputable person for the king to give you his signet ring. He didn't just give that to the, to the guy that was mopping the floor. It was personal. He gives his signet ring to us, guys. We will be God's signet ring if we will do this thing. If you will take the minute and help that person change their tire. If you'll put air in their tire, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be free. You know, it, a lot of times it needs to cost us, folks. 
We need to be willing, it's, whether it's time or money or whatever it is. If God directs you to somebody at the gas station, I have had, this has happened to me so many times, lady pumping gas in her car and, and you look at her and you see the, the, the look in her eyes and you know that she doesn't have enough money to fill the tank. She's only putting in $3. Who puts $3 in the car these days? Somebody that can't afford four, right? So I don't care how much money you got in your pocket, go put it in her tank. It's that easy, guys. You don't have to worship her. You don't, you don't have to worship God in front of her. You don't have to, to, to confess the whole Bible and tell the whole story. If God tells you to, do it. But you don't have to. Just be obedient to what it is in that moment. If the person in front of you in the checkout line is putting things back instead of buying things that are food items that they, you know their family needs... Maybe the Holy Spirit needs to kick you in the behind. Maybe the person behind you needs to run into you with their shopping cart. So you say, oh, yeah, hey, you know what? Put that back in your bag. I'll cover the difference. Do it, guys. It's those little things that are obedient. If we can be obedient to those little things, God will entrust us with more. If we can take those little steps and be obedient to that little word, that little nudge that he gives us, <laughs> we'll have fun. We will be his signet ring. And you know what happens? I've seen this, guys. When, when that happens and God gives you a word to speak over somebody in some crazy foreign land that you don't even know why you're there. And you're alone and you're hurting and you're tired. It's been a long journey. But God gives you a word and, and you release that word over that person. And you say to, to that person, I know you think you're, you've lived a boring life and you're, and you're over the hill and, and, and this and that, but God still has a plan and a destiny. Ma'am, I don't know what your name is there with the, with the um, purple and blue shirt on there, but God has a plan and a destiny for you today. And he wants you to be reminded that he loves you so much. He pours out his tears over the things that have gone on in your life. And he still has a purpose and a plan, and it's for good and not for evil, and it will change things in the lives of others, both below you and above you and around you in every direction you turn. There's going to be opportunities that you can sow into, and he is going to use those things to change those situations in life. And God has given me words like this to speak over people in third world nations, and I know, and I know, because I am his signet ring because I'm encouraging the believers and you're encouraging the believers. If you will be obedient to what the Holy Spirit gives you, you will change things. And then those words that you speak over people that God gives you to release into the lives of random people. That signet ring means it's the law of the land. It's sealed. The deal is done and it's personal. It's not a mistake. It's not corporate, it's personal. It will happen. So ma'am, I believe that's gonna happen. There's things that are gonna happen in your life and you better get ready because they're gonna happen fast. They're gonna start right away. Tomorrow, be ready for the word of the Lord to come to you with action that you need to take. And when that happens, because we are sealed, because you are sealed. What's your name, ma'am? Barbara? Barbara, things are gonna happen and start happening immediately. I needed to say your name, I don't know why, it's important. Your name is not a mistake, it's on purpose. God knows that name, it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you can say that about yourself, whoever you are, wherever you are in this room, whether you're watching on web stream or however how you wanna call that. If you will speak these things over folks' lives that God gives you, and you will be obedient, you are his ring you will put that seal on somebody else's life that will change things. It's a baptism of fire, folks. The supernatural didn't end with the apostles. I'm sorry, it's too late for me. I've seen too much. God has allowed us to be so blessed and travel so many places and see so many folks get changed and their lives get turned around and their, their, their bodies get healed of so many different things. It's all important. It's all part of the plan. It's not by mistake. And I'll tell you something, man. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun to see how God changes people's lives and to see what happens in their lives. Why does it feel like I bored you all to sleep tears? 
It's real quiet. You can hear a pin drop in here. Hallelujah. Amen. We need to shout out. Because if we don't, the rocks are going to start to sing. Guys, I'm telling you, I can't wait to hear the reports of rock singing in California. I am not going to be surprised. I hope we hear those reports tonight. I got a sneaky suspicion that many churches aren't going to obey that decree. But if they do, if they do, according to God's word, the rocks are going to shout out his praises. Amen? Amen? Listen, I want to pray over everybody again right now. But if you're here and, and, and you want more of this, that, that's my wife and I, that's our ministry, is more ministries. And, and it's, we, we call it that not because we live on more mountain, but because when we came back from overseas, we were broke. My wife was sick. And she dug her heels in. She said, God, I'll do whatever you want, but I'm not doing, doing it without the more of you. And she's dug her heels in for years and it's gone after the more. And we keep finding out there's more. You know, the Bible says that we, you will do these things and more and greater things. We don't even know what it looks like, but we want it. We don't want to miss out on any of it. We don't care how crazy it makes us sound, how goofy you think we are. How un, unstable you, th you think I am that in my 60s, that, we, that my wife and I in our 60s would, would do something as crazy as what we're doing right now and invest our retirement in, into encouraging the believers because that's what it's about. That's all it's about. That's what we've stepped into is encouraging the believers. It's nothing else. That's all it is. That's all you have to do. We've got this awesome opportunity. I'm hoping Alex doesn't get mad at me, but I'm hoping I can drag him back with me to Kenya again in August that, the, that if God allows and opens up the country, and, and I know the governments are the ones saying you can't come, but it's, God's allowed those leaders to be there, and he can take them out and put somebody else in if he needs to, if it's God's plan, and we're supposed to go to, to Kenya in August. I believe we're supposed to go to Kenya if God holds back, and it's not going to be in August because it's not right for some reason. I'm okay with that but I want to go back and encourage the believers. We found out through our time there that, that there's a, a lack of, a major lack of training in pastors and leaders in the church there. And now we have this crazy opportunity to go back and bring some teaching and training to the pastors. If you will do this thing and go back and encourage the believers, if you will go and encourage the believers that you, because you know what, most of the people you encounter are believers, folks. I hate to tell you this. I mean, you're going to run into some Muslims. You're going to run into some Hindus, right? I mean, they're out there. You're going to find atheists. But most people are believers. This is a land of believers. They may not be practicing, but they're believers. You're going to find very few people that are going to deny Jesus. If you will offer to pray for them, they will say, yeah, you can pray for me. We've been running this way for a long time, and, and very few people have refused us to pray for them. Some will think that because they're used to other people's methods, they'll think that that means you'll pray for them tomorrow night in your prayer closet and we'll grab them by the hand in Walmart and pray for them on the spot because that's what we've been taught. That's what we know. But for the most part, everybody you're going to run into is believers. We went to Africa. We, we went to Kenya last summer and, and I, I've been to Africa before but never to Kenya. So I looked up Kenya. What's the story with Kenya? What's their deal? What's the history of that country? That country is, is on paper 85%, I think is the number, Christian, right? That's a large amount. Why are we going there? That's what went into my mind. I'm sorry, guys, I'm practical. Maybe that sounds like I'm being lazy or, or, or something, but my thought was, why, why are we going to Kenya? Why aren't they coming to us? These guys have been Christian longer than we have. Why aren't they sending... What, what, what's with that, God? Is, is part of it a poverty mindset that they just think they can't? Because that's a land that's rich with, with, with gifts from God, minerals and resources like you wouldn't believe. Why, why isn't there not the most beautiful resort in the world set up on Lake Victoria? It's a gorgeous lake. We went there and we wouldn't, step, we wouldn't put our toe in that water. It's just a mindset. That's all it is. How can we help change that? Encourage the believers. 
It's a simple thing. When you leave here today, I hope you will do this. I hope you will do this thing and you will encourage the believers because I want to encourage you. I, I, I'm, I mean it with, from the bottom of my heart. God has seared this onto me. I can't get this out of my mind. My wife's tired of hearing me talk about Haggai. She's smiling. You know, it's true. But I love it. It's what God's put in me, and it's got to come out of us. It's got to get out. There's more in there, guys. I'd love it if you'd come up to me and tell me, hey, you were reading in, 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 the, in the book of, of Zechariah, and God showed you something in there. That tells me that you're going for it. You're, you're taking the time to get into those flyover books, and you're pulling something out of it. So right now, I just want to pray over you that this new fire, this strange fire of God comes over you. And if you want special prayer, you want an extra dose of it, come up, man. The, the, the reason that, that, that this church that we heard about in Jonesboro, Arkansas, is, is getting in trouble with their leadership is because after their services, or during, during their services, everybody gets knocked out in the spirit of God and they're laying on the floor. I didn't see anybody go down in here this morning as I was preaching, so maybe I'm not as good a preacher as that person, or maybe the Spirit of God's moving differently here. But if you want that strange fire and you want the touch from God this morning, come see me afterwards. I mean, I am going to pray and release you, so if you need to go, it's, it's Independence Day weekend and, and you got family things, I want to release you for that. But if you want some strange fire and you want me to pray for God to touch your life in a new and different way, I'm here. I will do that. Um, Jerry also is, is going to open up the baptismal. If anybody wants to be baptized, go see Labrada. And if you didn't, weren't thinking about it and this wasn't on your mind this morning, Labrada's got her hand up by the door over there. Go see her. She's got clothes you can put on. You don't have to worry about a towel or anything. She's got everything arranged for you. I don't know if the water's warm, but if it's not, so what? The fire of God is hot and it will warm you up this morning. So the baptismal it will be open afterwards. And right now, I just want to pray. Father God, I thank you for this awesome opportunity to come and encourage the believers, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you would see me as being fit to, to come in this place today, Lord Jesus. God, I just can't even stand. I thank you, Father, for all that you have for everyone within the sound of my voice, whether they're online and in some faraway place, Lord, or they're right here in the front row, Jesus. It doesn't matter. I release your fire on them, Holy Spirit. In Acts, the people were filled with the Holy Spirit and fire was showing on them. So Father, I just release that mighty rushing wind again in this place that everyone here, Lord, would be lit on fire for you, Jesus. That we would go to the streets and the marketplaces. That revival would start, Father, in a different way. It doesn't matter to me what it looks like, Jesus. It's about you. It's not about me. It's not about how it looks or feels, smells, or plays out, Jesus. It's about you. It's about the compassion you had on us that you would, that you would come here. That you would walk away from heaven. You would come here and sacrifice yourself for us. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, if you're watching online and you don't know, I just ask that you pray that God, that you know you're a sinner, you ask for forgiveness, and you ask Jesus into your heart that you could build this relationship that I'm talking about. I thank you for that, Jesus. I thank you for the lives that are touched. Burn afresh in us, Jesus. Burn in me, Lord. Burn in me, Lord. Thank you, Father. Move in this place. Move in Wilkes County, North Carolina, Jesus. The foothills of these mountains, Lord, you are doing something, and I thank you for it. Help us to walk in it, Jesus. Give us the boldness to step into the risk that you place before us. And we thank you for the reward that you have for us, Lord. Help us to be that spotless, blameless church that we need to be. And we just glorify your name. We shout out. We shout out as the rocks do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Bless you. Happy Independence Day weekend. Enjoy what's left of it. I hope I haven't taken up too much of your day. Bless you guys. And again, the baptismal is open, and if you want prayer, come on up.